Hi, this is Steve Galetta, and today I'll be presenting Fly Fishing Guide to the Bighorn River. Um, this is normally a presentation that I do at fly fishing expos, uh, trout and limited organizations, or fly shops around the country. Um, and today I found a way to put it online as a video. So um, I'm going to be discussing many technical aspects of fishing the Bighorn River. Um, a lot of these techniques and tactics I'm going to talk about apply to tailwaters, you know, throughout the country. But I'm also going to be talking about, you know, general um, planning for planning your first trip to the Bighorn River, kind of what to expect, the seasons, you know, what time to come. Uh, so let's jump right in here. Um, so again, I am the co-owner and outfitter of the Bighorn Angler Fly Shop and Lodge in Fort Smith, Montana. I've been guiding on the Bighorn River since 2006. Um, and this year in 2015, I will be releasing my first book, Fly Fishing Guide to the Bighorn River, um, which will be available from our shop or online or at many fly shops throughout the country. Okay, let's dive right into the river. Um, the river overview. Um, the Bighorn River is the most consistent wild trout fishery in the world. Um, the key to that statement, wild trout fishery. Um, our fish are naturally reproducing every year, fully self-sustaining populations um, of trout in the Bighorn River. So that's a really special aspect to me, unlike you know the San Juan, the Green, um, two other famous tailwaters where um, fish are stocked in that river, just fishing over wild trout. Um, that are naturally reproducing um, in their own ecosystem is a really important factor um, for my fishing at least. So um, there's a variety of fishing that you can do on the Bighorn. Um, you know, I we like to say that this river is anything to anyone. You can employ a variety of tactics, dry fly streamers and nymphs nearly year round on this river um, because of the consistency of this fishery. Um, and it also has two of the most important ingredients um, for any you know, tremendous trout fishery, and that's uh, a heck of a lot of trout um, and really abundant uh, hatches of insects, really good insect emergences, um, and a ton of food for these fish uh, to consume. That's why they grow, um, you know, large, and there's so many of them because there is so much food in this river, a ton of biomass. And it's also one of the most user-friendly rivers um, in the West, if not in the lower 48. Very easy to wade. Um, it's consistent. You can true 365 day a year um, fishery. The Bighorn is um, so gentle flows, easy to row, easy to wade, um, great access. Um, so makes the, the Bighorn a great fishery. So a lot of people don't realize this. The Bighorn um, actually starts up here in the Wind River Mountains um, as a small you know, creek called the Wind River. As it comes down, it enters in a Boysen uh, Reservoir. Um, when it comes out of Boysen Reservoir is when it starts to gain its size. And it's still the, the Wind River all the way until it reaches the town of Thermopolis. Um, this stretch from Boysen uh, Reservoir to about 20 miles um, just north, this river is flowing true north, um, up Thermopolis is a pretty good trout fishery um, in its own right. But here in Thermopolis is where it actually changes names, becomes the Bighorn um, at an area that they call Wedding of the Waters. It's really, you know, there's no waters coming together there. It's actually just a change um, in name um, that because the people in Wyoming called it one thing and early settlers in Montana called it another and that's just where it happened to be um, where they called it <laughs> changed the names there so um, but the river continues to flow north you know it turns into a warm water fishery as it flows north um, past Moreland and Grable um, and then it enters into Bighorn Lake here as it crosses the border and then kind of comes out and this is where we you know Fort Smith is right here and this is where we fish you know the famous Bighorn River um, is located um, here's a little bit more detailed maps so um, if you were, like I was talking about, the Bighorn comes in, here's Bighorn Lake, 70 mile lake, um, and Fort Smith is where um, our shop is located and we fish for about 35 miles um, north to about the town of Hardin here. Um, if you were going to fly into the Bighorn, um, you'd want to fly into Billings International Airport there, um, about 80 miles from where we're located. Um, and we're right here, and where we are in Fort Smith is in the foothills um, of the larger Bighorn Mountains. Um, lying just south of us there. Um, we're in about 3,400 um, feet, um, kind of in the foothills, the plateau area. Um, and then we're totally surrounded by the confines of the Crow Indian Reservation, um, which is kind of, I think, special and makes our area um, of big of, of the Montana unique because um, it keeps us totally free from development. This area of Montana still feels like it did, um, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. It's, it's wild. It's not over overdeveloped. You don't see houses all along the river. Um, and a lot of people don't realize this upper section of the river, the first couple access points in the lake region is actual Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area. So um, pretty special area um, that we're located in. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, here's the key to our fishery is, um, and this tailwater ecosystem is the fact that we have Bighorn Lake, Yellowtail Dam, a two mile after bay lake, and the river. 
um, flowing here. And, and this, this is why our river is so good. And I'm going to break down each of these components individually. Um, but you also see what I was talking about, free development. And you'll see, you know, just looking uh, north here, you see a valley that's just sugar beets, wheat. Um, you know, a lot of people raise cows in this valley, but it's totally free development because it is on that Crow Indian Reservation. Um, so it's it's a pretty special area. This you'll see um, right here in this top right corner is the little tiny town of Fort Smith, one way in, one way out. Um, and to kind of give you scale from Fort Smith here to this marina in the bottom left corner is about 10 miles. So a uh, really neat area Montana and um, it, we've kind of had this special system that was created um, when Yellowtail Dam was created that creates pretty amazing fishery. So Yellowtail Dam itself was um, completed in the late 1960s, built for uh, hydroelectric power, irrigation, um, and flood control. Obviously it's greatest byproduct um, was the trout fishery that was created before. Um, before the existence of Yellowtail Dam, um, this was just a true warm water fishery. What you had was pretty, you know, water that ran muddy most of the year through this deep um, canyon. Um, a lot of warm water species in there. Um, so really there wasn't a good trout fisher here until this dam um, was actually created. But the key to this dam is that it's a bottom release dam. Um, so the water comes out um, ice cold throughout the year. Um, and that's the key for you know our trout, our insects, everything. You have water that's warmer in the winter time um, and cooler in the summer. So uh, water temperatures are always in that kind of perfect temperature range um, because of the Yellowtail Dam here. And then Yellowtail Dam obviously created uh, Bighorn Lake, and um, Bighorn Lake is the true heart of this entire Bighorn River system. It's 70 miles long, two to 300 feet um, deep in most areas. Um, and, and when the, the lake was created, um, it kind of filled in all those limestone wall canyons and that limestone just feeds a ton of nutrients um, into this water. Also a ton of photosynthesis occurs um, in this water. So you have water that's uh, high alkalinity, a high pH um, and perfect, you know, nutrient rich water. Um, and that water is really the blood that sustains, you know, it flows through Yeltel Dam and sustains uh, and brings to life the whole um, river ecosystem below and, and su supports all the agricultural, all the fish, all the insects. So um, Bighorn Lake is, is very important uh, to our fishery. Um, up here, this is the marina I was talking about earlier. This is Oka Bay Marina. It's one of only two access points in this entire 70 mile lake. So a nice area, you know, there's boating up here. There's a swimming area. If non-anglers come, you can rent boats and it's just a beautiful place to see while you're here. Um, and Bighorn Lake is becoming a tremendous fishery in its own right. Um, each year we have a carp tournament um, that supports the Bighorn River Alliance, a great organization that, you know, uh, supported by anglers um, that really you know contributes to the overall health of the health of the fishery um, but carp fishing especially with a dry fly um, is becoming a phenomenal sport um, we've even started guiding it um, people are really really catching on to it it's great fun we call it you know freshwater bone fish if you will they pull hard they eat dry flies off the surface so it's great fun and it's in you know a tremendous beautiful setting up there on Bighorn Lake about 10 miles from Fort Smith like I said before um, the other nice thing about this lake is it does have huge trout in each year we get um, a cicada hatch um, varies in, in intensity each year um, but when it does come off these huge trout um, come up and they will eat large dry flies off the surface there's not a ton of them but there's enough you know where if you get a shot at one or two of these fish a day um, they also do come up to hoppers you know during the prime hopper terrestrial season but when we get that cicada hatch um, these trout tend to really show themselves in addition to the trout and the carp we also have um, really good smallmouth bass fishing up there and you'll see them you know cruising amongst the carp when you're fishing and and some days you can do pretty darn well racking up uh, good numbers of of large smallies so um great sport on a fly rod okay moving down um so then below yellowtail dam is after bay lake and a lot of you know tail waters they don't have you know kind of a secondary um, lake like we do um this is a very important part of our system because it allows dam managers to help uh, manage flows, you know, mitigate water. What they do is they'll release water into the after bay, you know, extra amount of sediment will set out, settle out in here. Um, it's kind of staging area for water that's going to go um, through after bay dam. Um, there's two uh, campgrounds on this, so really close camping um, right to the river, maintained by National Park Service. If you like to 
like to tent camp um, when you come. This is a great place to stay. Pretty area along along the lake here, but um, really important to our, our our fishery. And this adds to the overall consistency is that you don't have you know just water pouring in um, to the river from Yellowtail Dam. So uh, here's a picture of an actual after bay dam, um, and this is where the fishing starts for us. Like I said, this is like a half mile to a mile from Fort Smith. Um, really, you know, this is where everybody puts in to start the day. Uh, majority of folks is at least, and um, really good, nice uh, boat ramp here. Uh, well maintained, good sized parking lot, um, easy place to put a boat in. So this is where it all starts. And as you can see with the smaller um, dam here, you can literally pretty much start fishing right below the dam. So the river, um, the, the Bighorn River is a large tailwater river displaying unique Spring Creek characteristics. Cold, clear, constant uh, water flows throughout the year. Consistent water temperatures. Like I said, water warmer in the winter, um, cooler in the summer than most rivers. So just that perfect temperature that trout like. Um, there's an incredible amount of biomass, including aquatic insects, crustaceans, annelids, leeches, and bait fish. And all these, these food sources combine um, to provide tremendous angling opportunity um, for us as fly fishers. Um, what this slide shows is kind of what you can kind of expect from the bottom of the river. You'll have uh, fine rock uh, mixed with sediment and aquatic vegetation that those insects thrive off of. So easy to wade um, and creates, you know, really prolific fishery. Um, and this is what we're talking about. You get these big, you know, mats of aquatic vegetation and what you'll find in them are a ton of the bar crustaceans like the scud shown here. Um, so a lot of people, you know, they'll kind of complain about aquatic, the amount of aquatic vegetation at times in the bighorn, but this is what, you know, all the insects thrive on. And then that's, you know, obviously why all the trout thrive um, as well. So a quick history of the fishery. Um, the river was first stocked in 1966. Um, original stocking of cutthroats actually and rainbow trout. Um, you originally purchased a pass from the Crow tribe to fish. Uh, in 1975, due to conflict, the trout fishery was uh, closed. Um, a five-year court battle um, ensued and jurisdiction was given to the state of Montana. Um, and in 1981, the Bighorn River opened to angling. Uh, coincidentally the year that I was actually born. Um, so at this time, what happened during this time is we had these original stockings of fish, uh, the fishery was closed, but what was going on was, was state uh, fish and game biologists were, you know, managing the river, they were watching it, they were seeing that these trout were naturally sustaining, um, you know, they were just taking hold beautifully to the Bighorn River. Um, so by the time the river opened, you know, basically you know, dam or managers realize, hey, we don't need stocking programs. You know, basically, there's perfect habitat available these trout. They're thriving. Um, so we had a you know naturally self-sustaining populations from there forward. Um, Richie Montella, aka the Legend, um, one of the longtime guides on the Bighorn, caught 96 fish in 1982. They were between four and eight and a half pounds, uh, mostly on dry flies. So, uh, wish I was there to uh, experience that. Uh, the Bighorn River fishery today it consists of brown and rainbow trout. Uh, we like to see a 60-40 split. Most recent years, you know, it's kind of been a 70-30 split of browns to rainbows. Um, I'd say a conservative estimate of trout per mile in the main kind of upper 13 miles of this river is 6,000 trout per mile. We've seen, you know, populations all the way up to 10 to 12,000 fish per mile in the late 80s, early 90s. But, you know, typically in this modern day, you'll see about 6,000. That's more than enough fish. Um, high water years, we get more fish, more recruitment, um, and then lower water years, we get less recruitment of fish, but we tend to get bigger fish because there's fewer of them in the river. But on average, what you expect to catch when coming to the Bighorn, 15 to 16 inch fish, maybe, you know, kind of in that 14 to 16 inch range, um, with many reaching 20 inches, um, that 18 to 20 inch fish we really enjoy catching. Um, and the biggest fish each year typically tend to be caught in that 24 to 28 inch range. So there's still true trophy trout um, in this fishery. So what I like to say is that the Bighorn is anything to anyone. Each section of the river varies slightly in water temperature, aquatic diversity, water type, um, through our kind of four main float sections of this river, the 35 miles. And this makes for a variety of opportunity that challenges anglers of all abilities. I don't know any other river that is better for beginners, um, such as a non-angling you know, spouse, say your wife comes out and she's never fished before, have her pick up a fly rod and try the bighorn. She will catch fish or getting kind of a youngster into fly fishing. Um, I see kids as young as nine, but mostly at about the age of 11 can come to the bighorn and do really well. 
but for me, it's the match the hatch dry fly fishing and the sight nymphing opportunity um, that lies here on the Bighorn that you know makes me want to go out there and fish every single day. I don't know another river of this size where you can have such a visual angling opportunity, which we'll talk about. Um, and the streamers, dry flies, and nymphs can be fished nearly year round uh, on the Bighorn. So let's talk about the river's brown trout. Um, these brown trout were never stocked uh, in the Bighorn River. Um, they probably moved down from uh, tributaries or they moved up from the Yellowstone River. A lot of people forget the Bighorn is a tributary of the Yellowstone. So kind of moved into the river. Um, this picture here is what you kind of typically see as an average brown trout uh, in the Bighorn. This is a spring fish. Um, they'll plump up, get a lot fatter um, as the season moves on. Um, but our brown trout, they jump really well, which a lot of people don't expect, and they feed on top um, uh, very, very well. So these brown trout provide great surface action again two more average fish um, on the bighorn they look you know we call them cookie cutters but we get a lot of you know just nice healthy fish um, kind of in that like I said 14 to 16 inch range that are you know fun to catch anywhere and then of course we get a lot bigger fish um, this fish was caught in that riffle you know right behind amber there um, just big brute strong you know brown trout throughout our river system uh, such as that one and such as this one that Charlie caught, a true two-foot brown trout. This fish was caught all the way 30 miles um, from the dam on a dry fly. So there's plenty of plenty of big trophy fish um, out there in the bighorn. And, you know, everybody loves catching those, um, those brown trout, hard-to-catch brown trout. So... Uh, our rainbow trout, um, like I said, they were planted, but they are all naturally reproducing at this point. Our rainbow trout tend to feed more opportunistically um, on the bighorn. A, a lot of our biggest rainbow trout are caught on nymphs throughout the year, and they even take streamers um, really well. They don't tend to rise, um, you know, to your typical match the hatch fishing, PMDs, you know, black caddis, that kind of thing, um, as nearly as much as the browns do, but they will come up to the surface for, you know, a variety of terrestrials um, at that time. But but um, they're really healthy and they tend to be a little bit bigger on average than um, our brown trout. Um, but here's this kind of a picture of what you kind of consider an average rainbow trout. These things will provide great sport for you. They can jump three to five times during a full fight, pull line off your reel. Um, so a great fish to catch. And you can see they get that dark color from all the crustaceans, all those saw bugs and scuds and all that protein that they have in the big corner to consume. So they, a lot of them have that nice dark hue to them. Um, and then, of course, we get our, our larger rainbows. And these are, you know, those football rainbows that, you know, the bighorn's legendary for. And you got a big guy here holding a big fish um, that was caught on a nymph um, pattern, but um, great foot. I mean, that, that fish will take you on the ride of a lifetime. And then, um, you know, this picture, this is from the Split Islands area, for those of you that know the bighorn. Um, a nice rainbow trout that was feeding uh, during a PMD hatch. This fish was taken on a Mercer's poxy back um, PMD nymph, um, actually fished in the surface film. Um, so what we do a lot on the bighorn, if you'll notice, you have uh, the main river back in here. And actually, we're over here fishing in a tiny side channel that more resembles um, a spring creek where this big rainbow had slid up and kind of found a nice place to feed um, in there. So again, the bighorn provides a lot of opportunity um, to fish in the boat and out of the boat. And you can often find these nice rainbow trout. So let's get technical here for a second. How bighorn trout feed? Bighorn trout are simply on crack. Um, there's tons of food that trout are continually inundated with. Um, this all constant positive stimulus of food um, in this constant conveyor belt, a constant drift um, of food coming through them. And because of the amount of food that, that uh, was available to the trout. The trout feed more consistently throughout the day and the year on the Bighorn River. What I mean by this, you don't see the small uh, feeding windows like you do on freestone rivers. Like if I'm sitting on the Bitter River waiting for a mahogany hatch to come off and it's like, okay, I got to wait till one o'clock and those fish are going to feed till three o'clock. That's going to be my window for the day where I really have a good chance to catch fish. It's just not that case on the Bighorn. You can fish nymphs and catch a bunch of fish in the morning and then there might be a hatch where they'll eat even stronger and then they'll kind of switch back to eating those nymphs so there's always something because there's such a variety of food for these fish um, there's always something for them to feed on so trout feed in two ways on the bighorn um, opportunistic feeding is when feet fish feed on whatever food is available and easy to consume efficiently that's our scuds our saw bugs our worms our bait fish leeches grasshoppers ants and beetles 
And then they also feed selectively. And this is when one insect or food group is more available than another. The trout eat that one thing in particular. Um, and this can occur during any emergence. And a prime example is the black caddis pupa. You know, you might be fishing, uh, Ray Charles picking up fish, you know, throughout the morning. And then all of a sudden that black caddis emergence starts and the fish will start gorging on those pupa as they're ascending to the surface. If you're still fishing that Ray Charles, you might get a fish or two here, you know, opportunistically, but if you key into that selective feeding behavior when those fish are keen on those black caddis pupa and put on um, a productive pupa pattern, you're going to start to rack up um, big numbers. Um, same thing happens, you know, during any dry fly hatch. Our hatches are so intense. Um, cripples, duns, spinners, floating nymphs, submergers, half and half out emergers, and, and like a variety of different stages of a hatch can all be present at one time and overlapping. Um, so you need to figure out exactly what stage of the emergence the fish you're fishing to um, are feeding on. And once you figure that out, you'll break the code and you'll have a lot of success. So moving along, where trout feed. I break it down when I approach any river. Fish are either feeding in two places. They're feeding along the bottom or they're feeding on the surface of the river. Um, along the bottom on the bighorn, um, you have crustaceans, like I said, sawbugs and scuds, annelids, mayflies, midges, and caddis for these fish all to feed on throughout the year. Um, to the left here is a picture of a typical scud and to the right, a sawbug, which are you know, present throughout the year. Um, here are two of our most productive um, scud and sow bug patterns. On the left there you have the Ray Charles. Um, God, it's the staple pattern on the bighorn. It's fished every day of the year. It takes fish every day of the year. It comes in a fire bead version, a soft tackle version. It comes in a variety of colors, pink, tan, gray, orange, um, you name it. And then you also have, you know, a standard, you know, kind of bighorn scud there. Um, fish those in orange and pink and, and work really well throughout the year. Um, and this is what I'm talking about when I mean that bighorn trout are on crack. I mean, there's a stomach sample from the springtime when a fish was just absolutely gorging opportunistically on whatever lar midge larva and pupa um, came through. I mean, that's a pretty awful full belly. He, I mean, he had to consume, I don't God knows how many insects are in the palm of uh, my hand there, but um, it ate a lot of food. And when they're eating like that, um, they're highly susceptible to uh, imitation, right? Um, so that's a kind of a great example of when fish are feeding opportunistically, um, how hard they can be feeding and how much food is really in that drift. Um, then here's a, you know, a stomach pump that kind of shows that this fish is more selectively feeding. Kind of this day, maybe on a size 16 um, sow bug, that 16 Ray Charles would have worked well, but um, also, you know, came through throughout the day. Here's some red larvae. I'll pick those off opportunistically. Here's a scud. I'll feed on that opportunistically too. So, you know, that's what I mean when the fish are on crack. They just constantly in a day of the food and they just can't stop um, eating whatever comes by. So <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing thing to see on the, on this river. Um, so let's talk about, when we talk about fishing on top, I hate that term. It is so vague. Um, and this applies to any, you know, river you'll be dry fly fishing on. It's really what you're fishing is the surface film. And when fe fish are feeding um, either uh, in, on, or below that surface film, um, and the rise forms will tell you where and how the trout are feeding and interacting within that surface film. Um, so the surface film is like a molecule thick. Um, it's kind of provides, you know, think of it almost as like, uh, you know, it creates tension across the surface. Think of it almost like a saran wrap across the, the top of the surface, if you will. Um, but it's kind of, it's a barrier. Um, it's why you can see fish kind of skittering and floating on top of it. That tension provides that. And it's also what impedes certain insects um, from breaking through it and making it successful susceptible to the trout. Um, a prime example of this is midge pupa are smaller in size so they have a harder time breaking through that surface film than larger insects. Um, when those midge pupa ascend up to the surface they'll get kind of trapped under that you know molecule layer um, of surface tension and the, all those midge pupa will collect and what you'll see is the fish will just stack up and you'll just see their tail um, coming out of the water as they're feeding on those midge pupa underneath the surface film. Um, and they'll, you know, easy, easy pickings for those trout. So if you throw, say, a size 20 parachute atoms as like a single adult midge imitation across the top of the surface, um, the fish are rarely going to feed on it. So if you drop a zebra midge 10 to 12 inches below it, uh, right in their actual feeding zone, um, you're going to probably start catching a lot of fish. So um, same thing goes if the fish are feeding on top on spinners, you know, 
uh, you actually see, or on duns, and you see a take with an actual bubble, you know they're feeding on top, you should be fishing an adult pattern, not an emerger underneath the surface. Um, same thing goes like for, you know, during a PMD hatch, I'm off or often fishing half in, half out of mergers, um, where that insect is half in the nymphal shuck and half out of it, um, right in the surface film, because during PMD hatches, the hatches get so intense, the fish will, you know, kind of key in on what's the easiest stage of that hatch present, um, and that's often it. So read the rise forms, they'll tell you, you know, where and how those trout are feeding, um, and if you can figure that out, um, you're gonna have great success fishing on top. So these rules and understanding that surface film is key to trout fishing on any river, um, not just the bighorn. Okay, so let's get less technical here. Let's just talk, start talking about when to come to the Bighorn, how to experience it the best way. So um, there's 35 miles of highly productive trout water on the Bighorn. It's broken up into two distinct sections, the upper, kind of the famous 13 miles of the Bighorn, and then the lower river. Um, there's five federal and state access points that, have, uh, that you know, provide weight access to the river. Um, you do not need a Crow Tribe fishing license to fish here anymore. We get asked that all the time. Um, and you can walk in, you can rent a boat, or you can hire a guide. So when running a drift boat, um, you should have an idea of how to row a boat um, so your boat doesn't end up on the bottom of the Bighorn like this one did. Um, we do provide uh, rowing instruction the first day that you do run a boat. Um, it's called our Bighorn River Primer Trip. Kind of teaches you about the river, how to row the boat safely, and all that kind of things. The rental boat is a great way to explore the river on your own. You kind of, you know, you and your buddies out there, you know, in Montana exploring the Bighorn River for the first time. So it's a, it's a special experience. Um, and, and guys that, you know, have a pretty good, are competent anglers can have a lot of success fishing the Bighorn um, in this manner. So you know, it's something that we, we definitely provide rental boats uh, at the Bighorn Angler. Um, but if you can uh, flip the bill for a guided fishing trip, there's nobody um, that knows the river better than the guides that are out there uh, fishing and working it uh, every single day. They're the ones that are in rhythm um, with the river, where the trout are holding, you know, what insects they're feeding on, uh, time of day, you know, all those kind of things, you know, what fly patterns to be using. So um, a day on the Bighorn with a guide is a special experience and you're going to learn um, a ton about the river um, spending a few days with a, with a guide. So, um, the upper river, um, this is the famous kind of 13 miles of river um, on the Bighorn. Uh, the first main stretch is the after beta three mile stretch. Um, we call this AKA the amusement park. If somebody went out and wanted to tr you know, create the Disneyland of fly fishing, these upper three miles would be it. Um, because of this, it's also the most heavily pressured stretch um, on the Bighorn, but the water is very easy to read. Um, trout occupy every nook and cranny um, of this section of the river. Um, it's very easy to wade. There's abundant access. Like this picture was taken on top of After Bay Dam. Just in the bottom left corner here is actually the boat ramp. You can walk down, um, you know, this entire left side um, of the river down to, you know, a ton of productive um, wade areas. You can walk up from three mile area. Um, and when you put in a drift boat and float through this area, you can stop at, you know, there's so many places to stop and get out and really, you know, access and work this water um, really well. So famous three miles of the river. Um, from After Bay, you can float to three mile, which is a three mile float, um, or you can float all the way down to Bighorn, which is a 13 mile float um, in there. And that's kind of a true full day float. Um, and then the next section down that we want to talk about, the next put in is three mile um, access. You'll kind of see in the distance here, um, that's three mile access, the big parking lot. This is actually the first side channel um, to the river here, no name channel. Um, but in this section of the river, um, there's a greater diversity of water here and more room for anglers to kind of spread out. Um, and I consider this the best all around stretch of the river. The further you get from the dam, the water starts warming up a touch. Um, river starts to has the water starts taking on a lot more characteristics, um, more islands, that kind of thing, the further um, down river you move. So this stretch of the river, I mean, you could fish it all season and, um, you know, have new water to fish every single day. Um, and it kind of contains, you know, most of all the river's hatches throughout this. So um, a great diversity. And there's really good access throughout this stretch as well. Um, the three mile access trail, some people come and spend their whole trip just fishing um, off of this trail, 1.3 mile trail maintained by the National Park Service with easy access for kids, adults, seniors. Um, anybody can uh, get in here and fish this water uh, really easily from this trail system. Um, and that, this is working 
upriver from that three mile access um, towards After Bay Dam. And then in the stretch of the river, um, you also get the famous drive-in, uh, made famous during a, like a Sims Gore-Tex ad in the late 1990s that featured the owner, Mike Craig, um, the original owner of the Bighorn Angler. Um, it's just that landmark that people love, you know, seeing, taking pictures of, um, and floating by. So um, what you will experience at Three Mile at times is that it can get crowded because you have people floating down from Africa down to Three Mile, you have people putting in um, at three mile to float down the bighorn. Um, the key to the bighorn is I don't know any river that handles pressure um, as well as the bighorn does. Um, you know, it's often busy, but it never truly feels crowded um, because there is so much float fishing and both wade fishing opportunity, unlike a lot of other rivers. So all these boats will put in the morning, pontoon boats, guides and drift boats, um, and they'll leave this launch area and some of them will go park in holes and fish there most of the day and some will keep um, floating. So the traffic quickly dissipates and everybody kind of gets in their own water. Um, and, you know, you never hear people complaining that they didn't have, you know, catch a bunch of fish that day because it was, you know, overcrowded. So um, something to expect kind of on that upper 13 um, river miles is you are going to see people, but there's trying to plenty of trout um, available to keep people happy. So... Um, now moving down to the lower river, um, yeah, this is, you know, sees about 10% of the river's traffic, um, as the upper river does. Um, there are two main floats. Um, the lower river starts at Bighorn or what we also call 13 mile access, you know, so the famous 13 miles of the river ends right there at Bighorn access. And then you have two stretches of water, um, from Bighorn access down to Mallard's Landing, which is a nine mile float. And then even lower in the system from Mallard's Landing down to Two Leggings Access, um, which is about an 11-mile float um, of river. Um, this stretch of the river overall is better accessed from a boat um, because there is less wade fishing opportunity around these access points. Um, but a boat can get you into really productive water, and the fishing from the boat um, is, tends to be really good um, down in this area. So we're floating all the way almost down to Hardin, Montana. Billings would be 40 miles kind of this way. So let's talk about the lower river. The river, the lower river starts to take on the characteristics of a freestone river down here. A lot of people, like I said, forget that. Uh, the Bighorn is a tributary to the Yellowstone. So I've fished this a lot and it kind of has that feeling of, of the Yellowstone River. Um, in a lot of areas, you have long runs and flats mixed with heavily braided sections of river. So you get all these beautiful side channels that you can get out and that you can float and get out and wade through here. So it's similar to having um, totally separate rivers to fish. A lot of people ask, well, what else is there to do when I come to your area to fish the Bighorn? And it's like, well, we have the Bighorn and we have the lower river, which acts as a totally different river that not nearly enough people um, are utilizing. So every stretch of this river fish is totally different um, than the other one. You can use totally different tactics. So there's so much here and people realize this once they get here is that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity and, and you'll never get bored coming to the Bighorn because each section is totally different. Um, down here, you do have fewer trout per mile, but slightly above average size um, in the fish. I'd say down lower by two leggings axis, you'll have about 1,500 fish per mile. Then up by Bighorn through that Bighorn to Mallard stretch, you'll have about 3,500 fish per mile. There's far less angling pressure. Like I mentioned, about 10% of the river's um, overall pressure is really contained down in these lower stretches. Um, and the fish are far less... Um, condition angler. So they'll feed more opportunistically, come to the surface for terrestrials, you know, eat a streamer um, really well. Um, and like I said, I mean, when you talk about the fish per mile, um, this water down here isn't quite as easy to read, um, but 3,500, you know, to put in perspective, 3,500 trout per mile in that big horn of mallard stretch. I mean, that's how many fish per mile the Madison and the Yellowstone have um, in their best stretches. So in relative terms to up above, there's not as many fish, but um, when you talk about the grand scheme of fly fishing in Montana. There's still um, a ton of fish throughout these stretches to, to make people happy. Um, but the river does not fish as consistently year-round as in, in the upper river due to water temperature and irrigation returns. Um, this is more of a main concern for that lower um, mallards to two-legged stretch of the river um, where you do get a lot of irrigation returns in the water. You know, during the warmest summers, I remember one year where I was, you know, really cautious of going down to the lower river because we had a really hot summer, a lot of days, um, over 100 degrees. But um, 
overall, you know, it, it's, it's, you can usually, you know, fish the lower river, but just check with the fly shop, um, before you, before you hit the lower river, just to make sure that it is fishable if you're going on your own. Um, but what I'm going to talk about bug density is not as high throughout these lower stretches, but the trout feed more opportunistically. Saw bugs, scuds are still, you know, available and there's a ton of worms down here because an increased sedimentation and leeches as well tend to thrive in that sedimentation. Um, there's not as much match the hatch fishing down here. There are blueing olives and trichos. Um, those are the two main emergences and then a few caddis at um, different times. Um, but excellent worm, terrestrial, and streamer fishery down here. Um, the fish are more spread out. The river not quite as easy to read, but you know, you'll still know prime spots where to find fish. Less walk and access, so having a boat is a definite advantage. But there are abundant side channels to get out and wade. Um, throughout this stretch. So the lower river, I'd say overall is for the angler looking for solitude, who isn't about catching numbers of trout, doesn't need to, you know, do row arounds and nymph up 40 fish a day, but rather seeking overall quality experience and a shot at a large trout. Um, you know, this section is a great option. This is a picture from atop the St. Xavier Bridge. You can see the river's a little bit more wider. You know, obviously you can fish certain edges and that kind of thing. So you'd stop and fish her up along that island. But um, when fishing from the boat, you know, the fish can kind of be spread throughout um, this whole area. So not quite as easy to read, but still prime trout water. Um, here's another picture up from, um, this is at the Mallard's Takeout. So you can see, you know, things kind of start to flatten out out here. Big, wide agricultural valley. Um, and, uh, you know, still great fishing and abundant access. Um, just kind of give you an idea of what to expect. And then um, this is what I'm talking about. This is a picture of Rotten Grass Creek um, dumping in mud. So during heavy rainstorms or runoff, um, a creek like this can blow out the river and put a lot of color, a lot of mud in. So it's always good to check and see, you know, if this is running off color with a fly shot before you go down there. Um, this is especially during, you know, our upper river isn't, a, you know, isn't affected by spring runoff as far as clarity goes, um, but this lower river is. So at that main runoff times, you can't expect conditions like this. Um, so again, good to check with a fly shop. And then this is a picture from the lower two leggings um, bridge. Um, there you can kind of see again, long flats broken up with, um, you know, with riffles, um, islands, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, down here you get, you know, these nice rainbows. This fish was caught by Charlie during a trico emergence right underneath that left undercut bank. Um, down below Mallard's access, um, get a lot of really nice fish down there. Um, our trichos are the main emergence um, and the fish are big and healthy. So the million dollar question, when to come to the Bighorn? There is no true wrong time to, go to come to the Bighorn. Um, it all depends on the weather you prefer, the tactics you prefer. Um, I'd say our main um, fishing season is April 15th to October 15th. Um, really busy windows in there are late April, um, early May because of our blueing olive hatch. Um, and then again, late July, early August because of possible trichos, PMDs, um, terrestrials. And then if you are looking to totally escape seeing other anglers in the crowds, that March time in early April is really productive um, trout fishing. Obviously, you know, you can have to fish in the cold at some days, but it will always be productive. And then again, that late October all the way to Thanksgiving time um, is a really productive time to be on the river. So if you're looking to get away from crowds and have a great fishing experience, um, that shoulder season is becoming increasingly popular um, on the Bighorn. Now I'm going to run you through the kind of the different seasons and what to expect on the Bighorn. Um, spring, I define as March to May. Air temperatures typically in the 40s to 60s. I've seen it get into the hundreds in May. Um, you know, May, I guess, typically would be even into the 70s most of the time. Um, water temperatures are all typically in the 40s. Um, warmer in the lower river. That lower river can be as many as 8 degrees um, warmer um, in that kind of mallards to two legged stretch than up above below the dam. I've seen blueing olive hatches start there two to three weeks before you see them on the upper river. Um, and you can kind of follow the hatch up um, as the water um, temperatures, you know, increase throughout the spring. Um, trout's diet consists of scuds, sow bugs, midges, and betas this time of year. Um, as insect activity and water temps um, increase, trout begin to move from their winter lies in the deep slow pools um, up into more of those riffles and runs um, where you'll find them in the typical spring water. Um, and then during the spring, our rainbow trout spawn occurs. So um, what you'll find is our fish, due to lack of tributaries, will actually spawn in the main river where there's a ton of fine gravel and sediment anyways. And you'll see these just 
big giant um, light colored reds um, filled with these dark rainbows. Um, we leave these fish alone. There's no need to harass them. Let them, you know, do their thing, reproduce um, uh, successfully, and then move back into the main river. Um, at this time, there's still plenty of fish in the main river um, to be caught. So we just kind of let these guys do their thing. Um, but definitely a cool sight to see. Definitely, you know, more resembles Alaska than anything. Um, but our first main hatch of the year um, is our midge hatch. Um, prolific in March and April. We'll start as early, you know, as early February. Um, first major hatch of the year that bring fish to the surface. And the fish really key in on those larvae and pupa and really start to fatten up as their um, metabolism gets going in the spring. Um, Mitch Pupa, a lot of these, Jim Schollmeyer contributed a lot of the pictures to my book, so I've got these great pictures um, here. And this is uh, one of his pictures of a Midge Pupa. You'll see the presence of, of those wing buds um, on the insect and the gaseous bubble. Um, and this is when, in this stage, those pupa are ascending the surface and the trout key on these things readily. Um, they just love Midge larvae and pupa. Um, two of our most effective patterns that you shouldn't be without on the bighorn is the red midge larva. It just works all springtime. And then again on the right are root beer midge. And you'll see on, the, on that root beer midge you kind of have that synthetic wing imitating the gaseous bubble and the wing, um, wing pads on, uh, on that midge pupa. So really effective and, and a trigger for the trout. And then, of course, you get um, your single uh, midge adults. Um, we don't tend to fish the single adults a lot. What we try to do is key in on when they start clustering. Um, it makes midge fishing much easier to deal with. Um, a lot of people are intimidated by these small insects, but when they cluster, you can fish a lot larger imitations, and the trout will you know, throw more caution in the wind when feeding on those clusters. Um, so two of our favorite um, flies for that. On the left there is Harrop CDC Transitional Midge. This is a great fly to fish behind a cluster when those fish are being picked. Um, kind of like a stillborn midge imitation and then on the right is the twilight midge which um, I love fishing this fly because it's easy to see imitates the cluster can fish it up in you know large sizes all the way up to 16 obviously most of your midges are going to be kind of in that 18 to 20 even down to 22 range um, I fish this a larger size to give my clients you know the ability to see where their flies are and locate them on the water that's the key during these you know heavy intense hatches um, and then after our midges get going, blueing olives start, and this is, you know, when people really start to show up to the river. Um, can start as early as late March in that lower river, and I've seen it last all the way into early June. Um, this emergence is all dependent on water temperature, how long the hatch will last, but I find the magic water temperature when I really start this emergence really starts getting going is 43 degrees. And fish key in on emerging nymphs, dry flies, and spinners. They key in on all stages, and they, you know, they feed very abundantly um, during this hatch. So, um, pretty, pretty impressive hatch to witness. Um, the nymphs are very important um, on this river. This is kind of a more immature um, bluing olive nymph. It's not um, totally dark yet. It has a lot of that lighter color um, in the body. Um, and then as that nymph gets ready uh, to emerge, they actually turn almost basically black in color um, on the bighorn. That, that wing case starts to split and the body is dark. If you, you know, use your seine in the morning um, and you start kicking around and you bring up your seine and it has a lot of these really dark nymphs, you can usually expect an emergence um, to happen that day. You're probably there during the main hatch. Um, and because we see these uh, nymph insects in a variety of colors, um, underneath, we tie our patterns the same way. Um, and these are two of our most popular nymph imitations for the Blueing Olive Hatch. The one on the left is called the Wonder Nymph, created by um, Brad Downey. Um, great ascending, emerging uh, nymph imitation. Um, tie that body in black and an olive color. And then on the right is our Quill Nymph. Um, same thing, it's a, kind of a generic uh, mayfly imitation, but what we'll do is we'll tie it in cream, we'll tie it in olive, and we'll tie it in black, depending on the colors of the Blueing Olive Nymph that are present in the river. Um, our adults as well also go through a color change. A lot of people, what they don't associate with is the color of the insect's body, how it corresponds to the time of year. Um, when an insect hatches during those longer days of summer, when there's more sunlight available, the body of the insect is often lighter, excuse me, in color. Um, so what you'll see is because our blueing olive hatch lasts so long, early in the season they'll be kind of like a dark gray, almost sometimes even an olive brown. And as um, 
you know, the insect goes through its yearly um, hatch cycle, it'll start dark and actually end up a lot lighter. So what we'll do is we'll take a CDC sparkle on one of our prime patterns and we'll tie it in a variety of different colors depending on what color the insects are. You know, you might be fishing a different color in March than you are going to be fishing in May um, for those blueing off um, duns. So um, two bluing olive imitations that I really love, especially picky fish. So as the hatch goes on and the trout become more conditioned to being fished to, um, what you're going to find is the fish get more pickier. So you want these two. The first one on the left is a student pattern that we like to tie with a little uh, kind of nymphal shuck off the back, but a very sparse, delicate pattern that takes fish from the surface really well. And then the other fish, our fly on the right, is uh, one of Dave's student, a guy from Colorado's patterns. We call it the student emerger. Um, when the fish are eating floating nymphs in the surface film, that fly is absolutely deadly, drop below um, a larger dun imitation. So um, two great flies to kind of have in your box when fishing in the spring on the bighorn. So moving into the summertime, uh, summer on the bighorn, the river is an absolutely in full swing. Um, we call the season June, early September. Air temperature is very hot in the 80s and 90s. Water temperatures, however, are in those 50 to 60 range um, because of the dam, because of that huge storage of water that we have in Bighorn Lake, our water temperatures stay in that ideal temperature range. Um, trout move into the faster water, um, the well oxygenated riffles, that kind of things. You'll see fish in six to a foot of water, six inches to a foot of water um, regularly because that's where they can efficiently feed. Um, trout's died in the summer. We typically don't get all these emergences, but um, some years we do, 2012 um, we did, but usually a few of them come off each year. But trout's diet consists of saw bugs, worms, PMDs, trichos, yellow sallies, black cast, tan cast, and a variety of terrestrials including grasshoppers, ants, and beetles. So a ton of food in the summer, um, which allows anglers to fish a, a wide variety of tactics. Um, the first main hatch are the pale morning duns. Um, just like the blueing olive nymphs, trout love pale morning dun nymphs. And the one fly that works extremely well that you shouldn't be without on the bighorn, or really just about any river in Montana, is the split case PMD. As you can see in this imitation, you get that dark body. Again, these nymphs turn really dark um, before they hatch. And then that wing case splits open and it kind of shows through the color of the natural. So having that yellow in this imitation is a true trigger to the trout. So when those... Um, Nymph imitations are ascending to the surface, you know, having that trigger in your um, imitation, you know, the fish just take it um, really readily. Um, and then um, if you can, you know, the duns are important, but not nearly as important as the emergers um, and the spinners of the PMDs. Um, this is a picture of a PMD spinner. Um, when these hit the water, and if you can experience a PMD spinner fall on or any river in the west, the Missouri, the Bighorn, the Henry's Fork, um, it's a sight to be seen. It's, it's incredible. It's one of my favorite um, things in fly fishing uh, to fish. Um, so the fish throw all caution to the wind, and they will just, just gorge on these things. So... Um, two of my favorite PMD patterns out there. Um, the first is my Sipper Merger, distributed by Montana Fly Company. It kind of imitates that kind of half in, half out um, imitation, kind of that fish that fishes well in the surface film. Um, and I fish that, you know, that's kind of my go-to pattern when the PMDs are out. Um, but there's one fly I'm never without on the Bighorn every day of the year, and that's Harrop's um, CDC um, Para Spinner. I carry this in every size, every color to imitate every single mayfly hatch on the Bighorn or any other river in the world for that matter. Um, it's kind of my break the code. If I don't, if I'm unsure about what they're fishing, I often put that trusty rusty over them and the fish usually respond and take it. Because often in dry fly fishing, it's not what they're eating but what they will eat. So <laughs> remember that. Um, and then this is our yellow sallies, our, our one true stone fly that we can kind of count on on the bighorn. I see them as big as 10 down to 14. Um, you know, they fish really well, especially in the lower river. I really enjoy fishing this to bighorn and mallards. Mallards are two leggings. Some years we do get them really well on the upper river as well. Um, but two patterns that I really like, um, Kyle's beadhead yellow sally, um, and then another fly known as idol's parasally. You might see it also called the goldie hawn. And what I like about this pattern is it sits more flush um, in the surface. It doesn't ride too high. Like a lot of yellow sally freestone patterns will sit really high. This one's kind of sits lower in the water. I think it's uh, more susceptible to trout because of that um, characteristics. But it's pretty easy to see too because of that, that wing. But a parachute mountain max is a great fly as well if you want something big and bushy. Um, to kind of hold up a dropper uh, during this main summer hatch um, that works really well. 
Um, but moving on to black caddis, and black caddis is our staple hatch. We see it every year. Blueing olives are our staple, staple hatch during the spring season. Black caddis are our staple hatch during the summertime. Um, and the key to this, you know, the black caddis pupa provide great nymph fishing. And the key um, to this is that bright green abdomen. It's a huge trigger um, for, for the fish. Um, and here's one of our main imitations, and it's the Poodle Sniffer, one of our guides, Dave Palmer, um, created. And it has that chartreuse wire um, going through that body, and it's, it's just an easy trigger uh, for these fish. Um, and it works really well. And the thing that I like about um, black caddis is they provide what I think a lot better um, surface fishing than um, some of the tan caddis, or, you know, spotted sedge or hydropsyche um, caddis do because these adults, I find black caddis are more delicate of an insect um, than your typical tan caddis and they tend to ride the surface of the water um, longer and um, than your typical tan caddis do which obviously makes them more susceptible to the trout. The trout know this. Um, they also come off in very intense hatch and they'll cover your boat, they'll cover your waders, you know, you'll be breathing them in. So black cast is a staple hatch from us that can start, you know, anytime from late July all the way into September. Um, you know, anglers can count these in the afternoons and the evening. The egg laying phase is very important and you'll see green eggs and kind of all over your waders if you're fishing this hatch in the evening. Um, so also carry some of those patterns. Um, but two of the most effective black caddis patterns are uh, Harrop's CDC bubble back emerger um, on the left there for the picky fish. You know, towards the end of the hatch, I fish that bug a lot. And then your typical just plain old CDC caddis. Um, if you can't catch fish on that, it's often because your presentation's not right. It's just the go-to staple fly, um, simple guide fly, easy to tie, durable, um, and the fish just tend to love that fly. So a must-have when coming to the bighorn during this hatch. And then moving on to our tan caddis, um, like I said, we don't get them every year. We do get a small Mother's Day caddis in the lower river, and then we'll get them, you know, kind of later in the summertime. Um, but when they are out, the fish, you know, the fish love them, um, and they eat them really well. Um, larva, pupa, and adults, and then um, spent uh, caddis work really well as imitations. These are two flies. The translucent emerger, I don't know a more effective fly that's, you know, takes trout. I don't know if I get that fly refused ever. Um, you can sink it, you can float it, you can skate it. It just works really well. It's something in that, um, you know, bushy dubbing, something about that fly works really well. And then the double duck caddis as well on the right kind of sits lower and more flush in the water and the trout um, just tend to really like it. So must have patterns for the tan caddis. Obviously all your La Fontaine stuff um, works really well as well. Um, Loss of spent partridge caddis all work really well um, as well. Uh, moving on to trichos, I mean, you know, trichos, small hatches like this define um, tailwater trout fisheries like the Bighorn and the Missouri River. Um, a lot of people, this is something, you know, it takes a lot of time to get proficient at fishing one of these hatches because the insects are so small and the hatches are so intense. But when you once you learn how to, you know, master it, if you will, um, you can get some of your best fish of the year on these tiny insects. Um, so become a master of the small fly dry fly game. It takes a lot of years, a lot of practice, but it's very rewarding. Um, our trico hatch has really come back on the big horn um, since our drought years. Since 2012, we've had really productive trico hatches um, on the big horn again. Um, and, you know, the key to the trico fishing is you'll see these big clouds or columns of trico spinners forming over the water. Um, and you're just kind of sitting there and waiting. This is a picture I took a few years ago of a column. We're down Mallard's the two legged section, just waiting for this um, column to fall. Once it fell into the water, you know, the water started to boil. So um, a really special experience um, when you come to the big horn. You know, obviously August is a prime time for tricos because our water um, stays a lot warmer than other areas into the fall. I've, we've seen trichos well in November and sometimes even in December during warmer water years on the bighorn. So um, an incredible hatch to fish on the bighorn. And one of the keys that I like for fishing trichos is have a pattern that you can see. Um, a lot of times we'll fish, you know, a high wing dun or um, a high vis spinner um, in front of your typical spent um, imitation. Um, something that you can see, well, keep your flies dry during this imitation or during this hatch um, is kind of the key um, to fishing it effectively. 
Um, and then everybody comes to the out west in Montana during the summer months to fish terrestrials and especially grasshoppers. Um, grasshoppers, ants, and beetles. Um, we have, you know, pretty prolific populations of all three because we are in such an agricultural valley. Um, and the rewards of going out and kind of fishing a big foam bug, um, just searching, feeding uh, for opportunistically feeding fish along the banks. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, it's heavenly, you know, practice for anglers, and it's uh, it's one of the most fun ways to fish um, uh, throughout all of Montana. Um, and two of my most effective hoppers that I found are the white cloud hopper and that peach color. That peach tends to work really well. This hopper, I fish in the lower river a lot. I twitch it a lot, but I also hang droppers off of it to hold the dropper fly really well. And then the one on the right is the panty dropper hopper. And um, I fish this a lot. Again, it sits lower in the water. It sits more flush. I think it looks a little more natural, a little um, trout kind of respond a little bit more eagerly. So if I'm fishing highly pressured stretch on the, on the upper river um, or during major emergence, I'll, I'll, I'll fish this um, during when terrestrials are falling into the water. So um, another good imitation, but I think that beetles and ants are the most overlooked thing on the Bighorn River. Ant fishing, beetle fishing is amazing, and a lot of people, when they're not seeing a lot of grasshoppers, they just give up and go to nymphing. You can blind fish ants and beetles throughout the year and have great success. Um, the one fly that I am never without is the Bloom's Flying Ant. I carry this from size 12 all the way down to 18. I fish it, you know, in that upper size. I'll fish it with small little tiny bead head um, droppers and riffles. I fish it behind a hopper. I fish it on its own along the banks. Um, the trout are very susceptible to it. And it's easy to see because of that pink post. So um, that kind of rounds out um, our summer fishing. Um, the one thing that you'll see a lot in the summer, which a lot of people don't expect, are bears. Um, this picture was taken by uh, one of our guides, Dave Palmer, in the lower river. I mean, it looks like Alaska. Fish are a big bear just kind of swimming along. Um, in the river and just having a having a good old time um, out there um, you know the bears aren't habituated to people they come down to eat the buffalo berries in the islands you'll see them just kind of cross in front of you throughout the day nobody's ever had a real run-in with one um, whatsoever but um, just kind of cool thing to see we have the whole road this area up on the lake and the bears come down from there uh, during the summer to feed so kind of a neat neat thing and a lot of things times people don't expect to see see those beautiful animals so, uh, moving into the fall time, fall is just a magical time to be in Montana, um, you know, at all on any river, and the Bighorn is especially incredible experience. You get, you know, the cottonwoods along the bank are a blazing color. You get, um, you know, overnight snow as the blanket, the hills, and then, you know, the perfect dry fly days are when you get these low overhanging clouds with no wind. Um, you can often have the best dry fly fishing of your life, um, as my dad was having there in that picture. Um, but what time, kind of timing of the fall season, mid September to mid November, um, you know, we really stay through, you know, it stays, you know, in summer mode through mid September on the Bighorn. Um, again, air temperatures fall back down to that forties and sixties, you know, during October and November and the water temps kind of remain in that fifties region for a long time because there is so much water storage that whole lake has to cool down. So our summer hatches will run well in the fall on a lot of occasions, especially our trichos, um, black caddis, that kind of thing. It can last well into the fall. Our brown trout spawn in the fall, again, because our water temperatures are a lot warmer, like on the Yellowstone or Big Hole, you know, the spawn may occur in October. For us, it's late November, December, even into January that those brown trout will spawn. Um, diet consists of sow bugs, worms, bait fish, um, pseudo, which I'll talk about here in a minute, our fall blowing olives, and then all those leftover summer hatches. Um, streamer fishing is at its best um, that time of year. But our main hatch um, in the fall, again, another small fly, size 18 to 20. It's kind of the size of a blowing olive, but kind of has more of the body color, almost of a PMD, are the pseudocleons. Um, very intense hatch on overcast days. Um, the fish tend to really like them. It's technical fishing, but um, again, fly like the student, you prepare the right fly, have the right presentation. Um, you can catch a lot of nice big fish. Um, here's a close-up picture of a pseudo that I took. Again, you can see kind of that lighter color body, um, but small in size. The fish, you know, really love them that time of year. Here's one of my favorite imitations um, for uh, that. It's a hair up CDC biot done. Sits low in the water. We can fish all the way down to size 22. Um, just a great imitation um, for fishing uh, that pseudo emergence. 
slam. And then, of course, uh, you know, everybody wants to come to the Bighorn and anywhere in Montana and fish this fall streamer fishing. Like I said, our rainbows take streamers um, really well. Um, here's Josh holding a nice rainbow that ate a, a sparkle minnow in the lower river. Um, you know, great, great fishing um, with streamers. And then, of course, um, our browns, they get this nice dark color to them. Um, a black streamer is as good as it gets for really racking up. I think on small leech patterns, you'll catch a lot of fish. You don't always catch the biggest fish unless you're really dredging the center of the river with a heavy sink tip, but um, you can rack up a lot of numbers, uh, especially on the upper river, just fishing kind of a black leech pattern um, throughout the day, and you catch a lot of those dark colored up um, brown trout. So um, the one thing a lot of people don't realize on tailwaters is you don't have to always be fishing, you know, size 18 or 20 nymphs. Um, because of the huge recruitment of fish we get each year and all the juveniles that are in the system, our brown trout are predators. Um, they feed on small fish because there's a ton of them available to them. Um, so big trout eat small trout. I mean, they eat small fish in general. Um, you know, you can fish huge streamer patterns on the bighorn. Um, and in fact, a lot of people, you know, even less fished are, <laughs> are rodent patterns, mouse patterns. I don't know what species of mouse or rodent or rat or whatever that thing is, but um, that's not that big of a fish. And, you know, it was fed opportunistically. Um, it had this fish ate another fly with that uh, mouse in its mouth already. Um, I do a lot of mouse fishing at night um, with my clients. It's a great way to fish the river. Um, the bighorn at times, you know, you're always not going to go out there and catch, you know, giant fish and mouse, but there are times of the year um, when they seem like those mouse are more susceptible and the trout are, are lurking for them. So definitely, I guess my point with this is definitely look out of the box. Don't just fish the status quo. Don't just fish a size eight woolly bugger. Um, fish different patterns, stuff that the fish haven't seen before when you're going for the largest fish, especially, you know, when you're streamer fishing uh, the bighorn. Um, but nymph fishing on the bighorn, um, that's the bread and butter fishing uh, for people. I'd say 90% of the people that come on the bighorn fish nymphs, um, even though it is such a great dry fly river. But like in this picture, you know, you get a lot of doubles fishing from the boat. Um, you know, you can rack up large numbers of trout. Um, fishing from the boat, it's, you know, an easy way to learn, get people into fishing. Um, obviously, we have great uh, nymph fishing opportunity out of the boat as well. Um, but keys for the, and then, so keys for the nymph fishermen, um, I would say it sounds simple, but adjust your weight and leader according to the water you are fishing difference between, you know, having a mediocre day and a great day is often, you know, one split shot in a lot of these runs. Um, you want to have a drag free natural drift, um, when fishing the big horse, there are so much food. Um, you want your imitation to look natural alongside, um, all that, all those, um, insects, and become a master of drag and line management um, when fishing the bighorn. Um, the longer you can make your drift, the better you can manage your line, the better that you can mend, um, the more success that you're going to have. As those are the keys to having that drag-free natural drift. And one thing I tell my clients all the time is don't walk on the fish. Um, on the bighorn, fish choose um, food over shelter. So they'll move into really skinny areas where they can consume food very efficiently, calories, all that kind of stuff, versus, you know, a sheltered lie. Um, and keep your nymphs clean. You know, there's a lot of aquatic vegetation in the bighorn. Keep them clean or the fish won't eat them. And carry a stomach pump and a sand to determine what the fish are feeding on at any given time. Like I said, you can put on a Ray Charles and catch some fish, you know, opportunistically. But you really want to try to hone in on exactly what the fish are feeding on. Um, to have the most success and kind of rack up those good numbers uh, when you are nymph fishing. Um, and then fish from, from the bank, concentrate on specific areas. You know, don't overlook any water. There's fish throughout this entire river. So, you know, park your boat or wade fish and, and really work a lot of the water, which I'm going to show you right here. Um, good nymph water consists of riffles, runs, drop-offs, seams, flats, banks, and eddies. Um, this picture here, for people that know the area, is directly across from the Colorado Club um, and the three mile of the Bighorn stretch of the river. Um, and what you'll see on in this, um, what we got going on here is you have the main river out here. Um, you have a small kind of gravel island in the center and then a channel coming in. Um, this arrow back here um, indicates the seam um, between the... Uh, between the main river and the side channel kind of coming together where you'll find fish. You'll find fish down here kind of in the gut in the center of the run. You'll find fish up here in the main drop off at the head of the head of the run. And then you'll find kind of fish all in here in this um, clear water 
um, as well. Um, and one thing that is always indicative of where trout will sit on the bighorn is anytime you see a color change, anytime you see this kind of light to dark on the bighorn, you will find a lot of trout um, in that zone. Um, and you'll notice where this guy's standing. He's standing about ankle. You know, you're always standing ankle to knee deep on the bighorn, or you are walking on those fish. If you're the first person in this run during the day, you park your boat, you hop out, and you'll be able to sight fish in all this clear water. Um, you know, kind of all morning, as long as you don't walk out and disturb those fish. And you actually watch the fish, take your fly. Um, you know, you, there's so many fish holding in so many different places to fish this one run um, that you could spend, you know, half the day um, sitting in here. But again, the color, anytime there's a color change anywhere throughout here, you're often going to find fish on the bighorn. You know, another prime example, um, this is Seth fishing duck blind channel. You know, you're pretty much fishing an indicator underneath your rod tip, you know, calf deep, um, you know, in a nice riffle on the bighorn. So, you know, very easy, you know, you know, easy water in general um, to fish uh, with the nymph. Same thing here in this picture. You know, we, we got out early in the morning, um, put Seth in this little in this little seam. There's a drop off um, right out there in front of him, standing in kind of that dead water behind him, flip the nymph off that ledge, fly dropped in there, and boom, um, there's the result. A nice, big, healthy um, brown trout that was feeding kind of off that drop off. So, um, a lot of ways to fish your nymphs um, on the bighorn, a lot of different water, and you know you can rack up really good numbers nymph fishing um, on the bighorn. Um, we fish a lot of long leaders on the bighorn, um, you know, up to nine feet, uh, typically three to five x tippet. And the one rod that I, you know, people ask you all the time, well, what what rod should I bring when I come fish the bighorn? A nine and a half foot six weight is the perfect rod, um, as far as I'm concerned, for fishing uh, the bighorn. That extra six inches gives you a lot lot of um, better line management capabilities, allows you to mend a lot easier, gives you a lot better leverage um, over the water um, with your line. Uh, I don't really prefer 10 foot rods. I think they cause a lot of fatigue um, on your arm compared to a nine and a half, um, but that extra six inches over a nine foot um, really makes a lot of difference when nymph fishing the bighorn. So nine and a half foot six way is my go-to nymph rod for the bighorn. And then moving on to dry fly fishing, um, you know, what I love to do, why I'm here on the Bighorn. Um, dry fly fishing can just be magical um, on this river. Um, the insect hatches on the Bighorn are small in size, but the emergences are intense, so really big, heavy hatches. And the hatches are long in duration as well. So our hatches can last two to three months rather than two to three weeks, um, like you see on a typical freestone river. So long hatches provide a lot of dry fly opportunity. And our hatches are dependent upon water temperatures, um, especially are those spring hatches, blooming olives, and midges. So, you know, while we see we have a lot of hatches, you know, the timing of the hatch and, you know, tailwaters are consistent. Those hatches are always going to come off, but when they come off throughout the year, you know, they can come off certainly at different times. And that's going to all depend on um, water temperatures were affected by, you know, runoff and, you know, the way that dam managers are, you know, controlling flows at any given time. So, um, key, and that's a, you know, picture of a midge crawling out of a, uh, crawling out of a pupa there that um, I captured in, in my scene. <laughs> so um, keys for the dry fly angler, become a master of the small fly dry fly game. Don't be intimidated by it. Um, just learn how to how to do it and do it well. Hiring a guide will, you know, can go do wonders for um, becoming proficient at fishing small dry flies. Observation to me is the key to everything. Determine what the fish are eating on and how they're eating it before you ever do anything, ever make a cast, ever step in the water. Um, make a real calculated approach. You know, what size leader do I need? Where should I be casting from? How's the fish feeding? You know, what's the rise form telling me? Um, once you determine, you know, what's going on out there in the river, what insects are present, you make an accurate cast to the target. For me, uh, I use a reach cast for just about every cast that I make when dry fly fishing. Um, you know, we get a lot of good ang anglers that can cast a straight line 30 to 40 feet, um, but can't do aerial mends such as the reach cast really well. The, that is the one thing that will take you from an intermediate to an advanced um, fly caster um, is learning how to perform that reach cast proficiently. Um, keep your flies dry um, is a huge thing. Sounds simple. And then carry fly patterns for each stage of the emergence um, you are fishing. Um, it sounds simple, but build a fly box and go out there on the river. I hate when somebody comes into my fly shop and they go, oh my God, there's this fish were feeding everywhere. I just had no idea what they were feeding on. And, you know, they hand me their fly box. I look through it. You know, there's a 
PMD spinner fall happening, you had no spinner in your box. So whether you tie flies or you buy flies, you know, walk into your fly shop, you know, make up a bluing olive box, for instance, and make sure you have nymphs, dry flies, spinners, emergers, all there. So even if you're not sure exactly what the fish are feeding on, you can go through a rotation because you know you have something in there that imitates each stage of the, of the emergence that you are fishing. Um, so this is a, a video I'm going to show you here that's starting, and as you can see, this is during a trico hatch. There is just huge numbers of fish feeding um, out there in front of my angler right there. Um, I don't know any other river where you can um, get on a pot of fish like this, have this real intimate experience throw it um, <laughs> with your fish um, right there. But, um, you know, this is a thing you'll be floating down the middle of the river, look over, you see this huge pot of fish feeding. Um, and you know you can have great success but you know in this case we'll swing the boat down below these fish below that pot of fish um, and just you know make your cast up to them um, so pretty amazing sight to see all these fish rising in front of you and I don't know another river where you can you know get out and be this close to fish and you know these fish are just throwing caution to the wind and gorging themselves so uh, pretty amazing sight to see on the big one um, but typical, uh, typical dry fly water on the bighorn, um, you are fishing straight up a lot of the times, you know, in a run like this, um, what you'll have is, uh, insects emerging up in the faster water of this run, bluing owls, black cats, whatever it may be. Um, the current will kind of bring those insects down and then, uh, the current will push those insects into the bank, um, into these slower areas, um, of the river. Um, and the fish will slide in and they'll feed aggressively um, on those insects um, feeding along the edge of the river there. So this is kind of, you know, typical uh, dry fly fishing scenario. Um, you also get these areas um, where George is fishing here above an island. Um, you have water splitting. You have this kind of soft pillow area um, kind of in this region here. Um, and then you'll notice, you know, this fine gravel and aquatic vegetation that you see in this picture. You know, it's kind of the typical bottom to expect um, when wading the bighorn. But um, a lot of different areas to catch fish. Um, and then here's a here's a prime picture. Um, this is one of my clients, George. Um, we were fishing the upper three uh, late in the evening for black caddis. We came floating down the main river. Um, I look over and there's uh, several large fish uh, feeding along that log. I slide my boat in, you know, I realize, okay, they're just, you know, taking, uh, you know, basically black caddis and mergers. Um, you know, we get out, we make a real calculated approach. We we know what they're feeding on. Um, we creep up, get within casting distance, throw a nice reach cast over them. Um, I don't know where you can find, again, this intimate experience um, on the bighorn where you can be knee deep fish feeding in super skinny water, you know, it's, it's mono -y mono one-on-one -on -one fishing with you against that fish. Um, and if you do it right, uh, there are the rewards in this case, a nice rainbow feeding in there along that log. Um, great fish, you know, just erupted in those shallows after it took the fly and the hook was set. Um, then you see just kind of above George's head there, um, you actually have, um, a black caddis, uh, you know, which is actually a natural that I happen to capture in the picture. So, um, another example of, of dry fly water. And then in the lower river, especially we get these abundant side channels and, um, where we park our boat and get out and wade. I'm um, just, what I was talking about, you know, there's so much opportunity on the bighorn. You can fish the big river from a boat. You can nymph those big riffles or you can get in these little side channels and dry fly fish um, ton of opportunity in this case pete was working that foam line in the side channel uh, i believe it was yellow sallies that day that we were fishing to coming down fish were feeding in that foam line um, caught a bunch of nice fish out of this um, out of this side channel so um, typical dry fly setup and equipment i like an eight and a half four weight for all my match the hatch um, dry fly fishing when i'm fishing hatches i get a lot of control i found eight and a half foot rods very accurate um, and accuracy um, is the key to my dry fly fishing i don't need to cast distance you know you're never fishing 60 70 feet successfully dry fly fishing any river in the entire world i don't care what it is you're i want to be accurate from 20 to 40 feet um, an eight and a half four weight does that for me if i'm fishing larger dries or um, hoppers or terrestrials or dry dropper rigs I'll you know I will move up to a nine foot six weight um, rod leaders typically in nine to twelve foot range um, and tip it for your match the hatch fishing you know typically we're fishing four to six x tip it um, anywhere in there um, and then the key to dry fly fishing again keep your fly dry make sure you can see your fly I carry frogs fanny uh, amadou patch and a quell or loxa or a bunch of any of those kind of liquids um, as well to make sure my flies are dry um, all the time but that amadou patch is one of the keys for me I fish a lot of CDC patterns 
Um, it's actually a fungus that grows on a tree over in France. It comes in these pads. You squeeze your fly off and it's like bone dry. And then I use frog sanding it off and recondition that fly um, back to new and start my fishing again. So um, lastly, let's talk about um, streamer fishing here on the Bighorn. Um, you know, pounding the banks during the prime um, prime months. I use the center of the river a lot um, when doing my streamer fishing as well, just because other people aren't fishing there um, quite as often. They'll be pounding those banks. Um, but typical streamer setup, I fish six to eight weight rods, full sinking, lines a lot in the lower river and in the early season. Um, I use floating lines in the summer. Um, a lot of people ignore fishing streamers in the summer months. I have banner days when it's 90 degrees out in bright sun, um, fishing you know smaller streamers on a floating line. Um, sinking leaders do work okay if you just want to you know take that nymph rod turn it into a streamer rod quick and go at it on our river they do work really well especially on the upper river and just short stout sections of tippet um, off your sinking leaders um, work really well um, for fly patterns i carry you know who knows what they're eating every day, what the magic ticket's going to be. Obviously, I have certain streamers that produce better than, you know, more consistently than others. But carry flies with a wide variety of silhouettes, um, wide variety of color shades, some with flash, some without flash, some articulated, some not. You want different movements in the water, um, to, you know, depending on the color of the day or um, whatever it may be. So I have a wide variety of streamers um, to fish with you and just, just be prepared. A few of my favorites are the Sparkle Minnow, just works really, really well on this river. Um, fish, you know, tend to aggress. It's like a trigger fly. They just aggressively take this pattern. Another fly, kind of one of my sleeper flies. This is actually called the bonefish clouser. I think it imitates small bait fish really well. It has a really sharp hook. Those dumbbell eyes are really heavy. Um, clouser minnows in general work really well um, on the bighorn, and people kind of forget about classics because they always want to fish, you know, big stuff um, like this on the bighorn. Um, and obviously, they do work really well, like Kelly Gallup stall articulated flies that he made really famous this happens to be the circus peanut tied by russ madden but um you know try those articulates on certain days they do move really large fish so um that's what i have for you as far as the fishing goes thanks for listening today guys um this is the bighorn angler this is our fly shop we're fully stocked fly shop in town um real um laid back relaxed atmosphere i'm always there to give you the best information possible um we have nine hotel rooms we have two two bed bedroom cabins um, as well um, and we have a variety of houses and lodges as well kind of our basic um, lodge rooms there um, basic kind of fishermen's quarters if you will for um, coming and spending a day on the big horn then we jump up to our two bedroom cabins um, for four um, and then we go all the way up to our largest um, Riverview Lodge. But we offer all-inclusive packages, boat rentals, you know, guiding, fully stocked fly shop, everything you need um, to come and have a successful day on the Bighorn. Um, you can get a hold of us on our two websites, our main website, bighornangler.com, and then our blog, bighornflyfishing.com, where we bring you, you know, up-to-date fishing reports, great articles, techniques. Um, and then you can always call with any questions whatsoever. We're always here to uh, talk fishing and have a good time. So uh, thanks for visiting today and uh, hope you learned a few things and uh, stop in next time you're up on the Bighorn.